You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. At the tone, the time will be 12 o'clock. Or not. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. Welcome, everyone, to Mutual Presents. I'm your host, Jack Ward, here with Penny. And all of us here at the Sonic Society and the Mutual Audio Network would like to wish everyone a happy new year and a very prosperous and kinder 2023. You know, because this is the time of year for kids especially, it's time for us to go investigate our Mutual YouTube channel and see what Saturday Story Circle has for us. As usual, it's the continuing adventures of Jack Armstrong. The All-American Boy. I never get tired of saying that. This time, it's the Luminous Dragon Eye Ring, episodes 10 and 11. I've always been partial to kids' stories, as they got me so excited about radio and now just audio tales. But there aren't a lot of great adventure stories out there like Jack's. Maybe someday soon I'll be able to get some of my own ideas out there. For now, let's wind back those clocks and listen to Jack Armstrong from the Mutual Broadcasting System. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the Piper Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Ever shall our TV champions, known throughout the land. Wheaties, mm-hmm. breakfast of champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. <laughs> about what's that you're saying <laughs> oh i get it you want me to make up a sound effects story for the fellows and the girls but well, you want one about wheaties <laughs> okay then here we go you hear that alarm clock it's waking up slowpoke sam the laziest fellow in the neighborhood and sam doesn't feel much like getting up either No, Sam would rather stay in bed and sleep. Because if he gets up, he'll have to eat breakfast. You see, our friend Sam knows one thing as sure as shooting. No matter how hard she tries, his mother never seems to fix a breakfast that he likes to eat. Well, Sam is finally getting dressed and he's coming downstairs. He pulls out a chair... And he sits down at the breakfast table. But look, it's not the same old breakfast at all. Here's a new and exciting breakfast dish that makes Sam want to grab a spoon and wade right in. (laughs) You guessed it, it's Wheaties. Big, crunchy, gold and brown flakes of real whole wheat. And boy, oh boy, what a grand and glorious flavor those Wheaties deliver. A flavor that makes a smash hit with Sam. Well, sir, you can call Sam a slowpoke now. The minute that alarm clock rings, he's up and racing downstairs to get his Wheaties. Sam likes them fixed in a big bowl with lots of milk or cream and sliced bananas or some other fruit. He calls that dish a real breakfast of champions. And so will you, I know, when you get yourself some Wheaties. I'm telling you, those Wheaties flakes are good. So downright good, you'll probably want second helpings every morning. Now, be sure to ask for the big orange and blue package with the two famous General Mills trademarks, Wheaties and Breakfast of Champions. And now, Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Jack and Billy are rowing their hearts out, getting the last of the supplies aboard the two-master schooner Spindrift. The spindrift rides her mooring like a gray ghost, while the San Francisco fog hides her from the view of hostile eyes on shore. The schooner is all ready to start on her perilous journey to the Sulu Sea in the Philippines to recover a precious cargo of uranium sunk off an uncharted reef. Jack and Billy, as they bend to the oars, know that other persons are trying desperately to get possession of a mysterious ring which Uncle Jim had just received. 
a ring which may contain the secret of the uranium. Betty, alone on the schooner in the fog, is having the fright of her life. But Jack doesn't know it yet. Listen. Yes, Billy, but this fog is thick. Well, you could cut it with a knife. I'll say, Jack. I bet we've rode a hundred miles just taking supplies out to the spindrift. I know we have. Uncle Jim must be taking on enough stuff to take us to the Sulu Sea and back without stopping. Never saw so much hardtack in all my life. And as for canned food, hey, is there anything they don't put in cans these days? <laughs> and rope, Jack. Why, I bet you we have enough rope to stretch from here to the moon. Uh, don't forget the two most important items. Oh, what are they? Professor Loring's scrap of chart and the ring. Well, I agree that we need that chart, Jack, if we're ever going to find his yacht. But doggone if I can figure out why that ring is so important. Well, that gang thinks it's important enough to turn the town inside out to get it from us, even before we start on the trip. I know, Jack. There must be some secret to it that we haven't discovered yet. Have you thought how terribly important this cruise of ours may be? You mean... I mean if we let that uranium fall into the hands of the wrong kind of people. Yeah, I know, Jack. Maybe with that supply of uranium, they could split the atom and then invent engines that could take airplanes all over the world without stopping. Billy, when I think of this country of ours, with millions of homes stretching from sea to sea, with everybody working and pulling together to have a nation where people can be free and do big, fine things, why, it makes me realize what a terribly important job we've got ahead. Yeah, this is sure one job we've got to make good on, even if we have to get the better of a dozen gangs. Well, the fog's lifting, Billy. There's the spindrift right ahead of us, like a ghost in the fog. But she's a beauty of a ghost, Billy. Say, do you still think that we're going to have room in the main hold to stow Uncle Jim's auto gyro? He'll be awfully disappointed if we don't. He's flying it over soon. Well, of course, it hasn't any wings, and the windmill rotors come apart. But just the fuselage and motor takes up an awful lot of room. Well, I figured we've left just enough room for it. And you can bet we'll need it. And that Sulu Sea is a mighty big piece of dampness. Well, we'll need it, all right. I guess a yacht sunk on an uncharted reef is harder to spot than a needle in a haystack. Yeah, but one of us can go up in the auto gyro and look over a lot of square miles. Watch this tide drift, Billy. It's sweeping us right up on the spin drift. I will, Jack. Hi, Betty. Throw us a line, will you? Oh, Jack, Billy, I'm so glad you got here. Hey, here, here's the line. I thought you'd never come. Why, what's the matter? Here, Billy, make fast. Betty's all excited. Something's happened. There you are. Fast she is, Jack. Climb up. We'll store these supplies later. What's happened, Betty? I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether anything actually happened or not, but I thought... I thought I heard footsteps. Footsteps? footsteps. I know it sounds silly now, but it didn't then. I mean, it didn't to me. But, but Betty, you aren't telling us anything. Well, it was just about an hour ago. I was in that... That little cabin way up in front. You mean the chain locker at the bow? Yeah, the chain locker. I was stowing the last supplies you brought aboard. The ones you said should go there. The sea anchor and those coils of rope and that sort of stuff. And suddenly I thought I heard a boat bump against the spindrift. A boat? Just a small boat. I couldn't be sure. I thought it might be you and Jack. But I listened and I didn't hear you, so I went back to work. And then... Go on. Yes. Then, suddenly, I thought I heard footsteps on deck. Not natural footsteps. Not the way you sound when you're walking, but quiet footsteps. Just as though someone didn't want to be heard. I bet you were scared. What did you do? I just listened. At first, I thought I was mistaken. I wasn't scared, not then. I thought it might be you and Billy come back or somebody from the dock to see about something. So I went on deck. And there wasn't anybody there. And so I suppose you got really scared then. Oh, yes, I did. Because I just knew that someone had been on the boat. And I thought, I thought he might still be on hiding somewhere. Oh, gosh, Betty, I, I'm afraid the fog and those spooky fog horns have been too much for you. I don't know about that, Billy. Remember, there are two good reasons for someone wanting to sneak aboard. That's right, Jack. I'd almost forgotten. There's the scrap of chart they'd be after and that ring. But, gosh, they must know that we wouldn't leave anything as important as that on board with just Betty. Oh, of course, there are a lot of noises that could sound like footsteps to a person below. The waves, the creak of the rigging, the slap of the halyards against the masts. But, Jack, if somebody did come aboard, they wouldn't cut their boat adrift. Not unless they wanted to stow away and go to the Sulu Sea with us. Oh, I know it all sounds silly. I know that no one would come aboard and let his skiff float away. And yet, and yet I know that someone was aboard. Maybe he still is aboard. Strange things are happening to us, Betty, so perhaps you're right. Billy, suppose I take a look below while you and Betty unload the skiff. Well, Jack, maybe, I, maybe I'd better come with you. <laughs> no, Billy. Spook hunting is a one-man job. And we've got to get that stuff aboard. 
As soon as the fog's all gone, Uncle Jim will fly in with the auto gyro and we'll shove off. Okay, Jack. And if the spook is too much for you, sound off and I'll come running with my special brand of spook powder. Hey, come on, Betty. Let's go. All right, Billy. Uh, be careful, Jack. Maybe I'm silly and all that, but if there is anyone on board, well, be careful. If I really thought there was a chance, I'd go with him. But we gotta get this stuff stowed away, Betty. Uncle Jim's awfully anxious to catch this ebb tide. Oh, Billy, what a lot of books. Yep. When we get back to Hudson High, we'll be so far ahead that they're gonna have to hold a special commencement for us. Well, here's one on the morrows. Yeah, don't forget that Uncle Jim is awfully interested in that white sultan of the morrows. The one that Professor Loring wrote about. Bet your life we'll find ourselves in his country before we're through. Oh, I hope so. Oh, look, the fog's just about gone. Uncle Jim should be here soon. Guess so. Gee, Willikins, with these boxes are sure heavy. There. Glad that's the last of them. Oh, here comes Jack. Did you find anything, Jack? <laughs> no spooks, Betty. But you'd be surprised how many places there are where a stowaway could hide for a while. And I'll bet you haven't looked in all of them either. I guess I know real footsteps when I hear them. But, Betty, what good would it do anybody to stow away? He couldn't do anything against the four of us. He, he could while we were asleep. And sail the boat across the Pacific himself? He'd be some man. Hey, look, here comes Uncle Jim. Boy, we got those supplies unloaded just in time, Jack. Look, I never can get quite used to that auto gyro. Well, neither can I. With that windmill whirling above it, no <laughs> wings, it looks like a bad dream. But it's a mighty useful machine, just the same, Betty. The propeller drives it forward while the rotors keep it up. And it can practically stand still in one spot and still stay up. Well, he's dropping. Yeah, but gradually. See, he's coming down right by the ship. He's got pontoons on her. Ship ahoy! Heave the line and I'll come alongside. Okay, Uncle Jim. Stand by. Here you are. Good shot, Jack. Lend a hand, Billy, and we'll pull him in while he folds up the rotor. Oh, okay. Got your topping lift all rigged? Yep. Fine. Swing out the gap and lift her aboard. There it is. Horse like, Billy. Yeah, man. Let the hook get down to that eye bolt in the fuselage. <sighs> there. All set, Uncle Jim? All set. All away. I'll help. Swell. All together now. Yo. Yo. Ho. ho. Yo. Ho. Yo. Ho. Yo. Ho. Easy Yo. there. Ho. Good. Swing her in. Now go it easily. Okay. Take it slow now. Just That's a little it, bit at a time. Okay. Hey, boy. Go wait till I get out. Okay. Hold it, Jack. Now we'll put her below. All right, oh. Swing her over the main hold. Lower her gently. And lash her for the ferry well. <sighs> Betty, Easy, Jack. Oh, do you look so worried? Oh, it's nothing, Uncle Jim. That is, Jack and Billy think it's nothing, but while they were gone, I thought I heard footsteps on the deck. Footsteps? Are you sure? Well, almost sure. But Jack went below and looked all around, and he didn't find anybody. That was odd. Well, we won't let it delay us. Uncle Jim, did you have time to stop at the research library to check up on the ring? Yes, I did, Betty, but they couldn't help me. The ring was as much a mystery to them as it is to us. Well, and there's nothing else to keep us from shoving off. Not a thing, Betty. Shake out the stops and the sails, and when the auto gyro stowed, we'll hoist canvas and slip our moorings. Batten down that hatch well, Jack. We may find a bit of a duster when we clear the Golden Gate. All fast, sir. Good. Up mainsail, you and Billy. Right. Betty, run up the jib. Yep. We'll hoist the folks later. <laughs> slip the mooring, Jack. Atta boy. Now watch your pick up. <laughs> Oh, she's healing over. She'll heal over more than this when she clears the gate. Oh, I love it. Those sails, look how the wind fills them. <laughs> the wind's our friend now, Betty. But it may be our worst enemy before this voyage is through. Run down in the cabin like a good girl and get my sweater. You bet, Uncle Jim. This breeze is chilly. Gee, it's good to be under sail again. When do you want me to take my watch at the wheel, Uncle Jim? I'll set the watches after we clear the Golden Gate, Jack. Hey, look at Betty popping up from the cabin. What's up, Betty? Uncle Jim! What's happened? There is someone below. Billy, take the wheel. Jack and I are going to find out what this is all about. Come on, Jack. Well, what is this all about? Is someone really hidden away in Uncle Jim's cabin? If so, you can just bet he's not there for a free ride to the Sulu Sea. Do you suppose it has anything to do with that mysterious ring? After all, there's something mighty important about that ring that Jack and Uncle Jim haven't discovered yet. So listen in, all of you, at the same time next Monday to the mystery of this remarkable ring with Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Now, while you're thinking about it, 
be sure to ask Mother to get you some Wheaties. Boy, those Wheaties flakes will taste mighty good for breakfast tomorrow and Sunday. You're all set to start the weekend in champion style if you'll ask for Wheaties now. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the brand. This is Franklin McCormick saying goodbye till Monday for General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, who have just presented another episode of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Oh, just buy Wheaties, the best breakfast food in the land. Wave the Piper Hudson High, boys, show them high. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Every shot our team be champions, known throughout the land. Wheaties, mm -hmm. breakfast of champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Look, will you, will you do yourself a favor right now that is, after listening to tonight's Jack Armstrong adventure, it's just about surefire to let you in on a barrel full of pleasure. How's about it? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask Mother to be sure and buy a couple of packages of Wheaties right away. Got that? Then, every morning for the next four mornings, and that'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings, remind Mother to serve you a breakfast of champions. After you've eaten this extra satisfying combination of Wheaties, milk or cream and fruit for four mornings in a row, I'd like to have you ask yourself if you've ever found any other breakfast dish that gave you as much real pleasure and satisfaction as this breakfast of champions. And say, I'm willing to go on record that you'll agree with me there just isn't any other breakfast dish on the market that can touch this championship combination for flavor. You see... In a breakfast of champions, you get the combined flavors of three great foods. Whole wheat, milk, and your favorite fruit. When you add the flavor of the fruit you like best to the extra good malty flavor of Wheaties, well, you've got a taste combination that's so doggone good it just can't be described. So if you're a good sport, and if you'd like to enjoy the best tasting breakfast dish I know... Be sure to put in your bid for a breakfast of champions the next four mornings in a row. Ask Mother to get you some Wheaties right away. And now, Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Hello, fellows and girls. Here we are, all set to accompany Jack Armstrong, Billy, Betty, and Uncle Jim on a thrilling trip across the Pacific. We're glad you're with us for this exciting series. And right now... Jack and his companions are embarking on a journey of high adventure, and we know that you'll want to listen every day. The schooner Spindrift is sailing out of San Francisco Bay for the Sulu Sea, far on the other side of the Pacific. With Jack, Billy, Betty, and Uncle Jim aboard, she's slipping through the bay toward the Golden Gate, with its mighty suspension bridge stretching above. Ahead of her lies the Pacific, and the search for a sunken yacht with its vital cargo of uranium-235 the element that may hold the secret to unlock the limitless power contained in the atom. But things are happening aboard the Spindrift. While Billy has the wheel with Betty beside him, Jack and Uncle Jim are going below to search out a hidden stowaway Betty discovered in the main cabin. Listen. I looked in here before, Uncle Jim, but I didn't see a soul. But at that time, you didn't really expect to find anyone, did you, Jack? Well, no. I thought that Betty was just a little nervous and was imagining things. She wasn't imagining things this time, Jack. You can depend on that. She certainly must have seen something. Be careful now. If anyone's here and tries to take us by surprise... I'll be careful. Look, there's no one here. Doesn't seem that way, does it? But Betty's fright was certainly real. Wait a minute. Look, Uncle Jim, look under that port bunk. Is that an old shoe turn on end? Or is we'll that... We'll soon find out. I'll give it a twist. Oh, there's split my main brazen. They don't take me for a landlord. Well, what do you know? Does that sound familiar? Why, it's Blackbeard. Blackbeard. I'll twist his foot again and make sure. Oh, and lay off that splice and let an old car come up for air. Rip my royals, but that's a fine way to treat an old friend. Up you come, Blackbeard. <laughs> oh, rigging and all. <laughs> Uncle Jim, did you ever see Blackbeard look yeah. so foolish? He should look foolish, pulling a landlubber trick like this. Well, Blackbeard, what's your story this time? Well, it's a long and a sad story this time, Jack. Trim my sheets if it ain't. The 
The story of double cross and misplaced faith. You'd better make it short, Blackbird. We're going to turn you over to the Harbor Patrol before we clear the Golden Gate. Oh, now, Captain Jim, sir, you wouldn't do that to an old shipmate. And I'll help him, Blackbeard. See if I won't. Well, now, cross must stays, but you're almighty suspicious. Uh, both of you. Why, I have got some information that's worth a pirate's treasure to you. That I have. You ought to know something. You're in head over heels with this gang that's trying to cross us up. No, Captain Fairfield, that's where you're wrong. I'll admit I was in with them, but there's a limit, Captain Jim, sir, to what even Blackbeard Flint can swallow. It must be some limit, Blackbeard. Well, come up on deck, where I can spot the first patrol boat, and we'll hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Captain Fairfield. And when you listen to an old salt spin a sad yarn, you'll find mercy in the bottom of your heart. Uh, uh, up we go. You go first, Jack, then Blackbeard. I'll bring up the rear. Okay, Uncle Jim. Hi, Betty. We found your stowaway. Blackbeard, so it was you. Why, Split McKeelson, Miss Betty, it was you who gave me away. And there's Billy a holding the wheel like a true son of the salt. Well, I'll be doggone Blackbeard of all people. Hey, at your service, Billy. Uh, it is a fine feeling to have a rolling deck under me again. Uh, but watch your sheets there, Billy. You're spilling a little wind from your sails. Uh, uh, trim in. Never Billy. mind the sailing lessons, Blackbeard. I see a patrol boat on our lee, and you haven't much time. Better make it good, Blackbeard. It'll be a long time before you have a chance to spin us another yarn. Cross my stays, Jack. You shouldn't be so quick at disbelieving. Now, I admit, when you and I crossed back at Hudson, I was in with bad company. They sent me there on a little matter of a chart or something, uh, maybe to see if you'd gotten a wee package from abroad. Oh, but... so you know about the ring, too. Quiet, Billy. We'll let Blackbeard do the talking. Oh, I'll be honest with you, Billy. They told me everything, and that's why I'm here, to spill the truth to my old friends. You better get to it, Blackbeard. That patrol boat is closing in. Now, listen, Jack, my lad, and you'll hear a tale that'll make your blood curdle. You and your Uncle Jim are up against a cruel and desperate collection of half-breeds who'll stop at nothing. Nothing, my lad, nothing. And the skipper of this gang of cutthroats hangs out in Manila, but he's got his men everywhere. Everywhere. Why, he can turn his little finger and they'll do be doing handsprings for him in San Francisco or Timbuktu. <laughs> we'll scratch Timbuktu off our list then, Blackbeard. Uh, it won't do you no good, Jack. No matter where you are, he'll have his crew a shat on you and ready to pounce whenever he gives the word. They didn't have much luck pouncing in San Francisco, Blackbeard. Ah, uh, Billy, you're a little too smart for him there. But they know you better now. And Billy, my lad, if you'll uh, port your helm a wee bit, we'll sort of edge away from that patrol boat. Uh, well, as I was a saying, uh, you're up against a crew the likes of which you've never seen. They know a lot, they do. They know that Professor Loring's yacht went down somewhere in the Sulu Sea. And they'd like to know where, wouldn't they, Blackbeard? They'll stop at nothing to find out where the yacht lies, Miss Betty. And they know... Uh, listen now, Captain Fairfield... They know that you've got a wee bit of chart that tells where she's a lion in Davy Jones' locker. Patrol boat's getting close, Blackbird. Uh, douse my glimpses if she ain't Captain Fairfield, but, but when I'm through, uh, you'll maybe change your tag. What else do they know, Blackbeard? They know you've got a certain ring. Why, Jack, my lad, they even know you had that ring sent to the small post office before you picked it up. And they want that ring just as bad as they want that little chart. Anything else, Blackbeard? Why, uh, Colonel McComber's Captain Fairfield. Ain't that enough? You haven't told us why you had this sudden change of heart, nor why you stowed away. Shrivel my shroud, sir, so I haven't. Oh, Billy, my lad, it fair breaks my heart to see you mishandle such a trim schooner that way. Now, uh, if you'll trim in that mainsail, just... To... Don't mind him, Billy. He's just stalling for time while he thinks up a good answer. Now, there, Miss Betty, you always had a kind word for me for this. It is a sad blow to an old tire when you turn again, me. Uh, since Blackbeard doesn't want to talk anymore, Jack, you'd better hoist that signal flag to call in the patrol boat. Uh, why, trip my top and lift a... Uh, of course I'll talk, Captain Fairfield. And uh, you was asking... I was asking why you had this sudden change of heart and why you stowed away. You've had enough time to think up a bully answer. Well, if I seem slow in answering, Captain Fairfield, it's cause the matter fair rings my heart. Captain Fairfield, you wouldn't believe it. But I've been double-crossed. <laughs> you? Double-crossed? Double-crossed, Jack. I didn't know that people could have such black hearts. Why, Jack, that gang is lower than a sunken schooner. It must have been a new experience for you, Blackbird. 
Tell us how they double-crossed you. Uh, Captain Fairfield, I'll be honest with you. Frank and honest. They sent me to Hudson to do them a small favor. And they says to me, they says, uh, Blackbeard, you may be able to do it or you may not. But whether you do it or not, we'll buy your ticket back to Manila. A small favor? Do you call trying to steal that chart from us a small favor? Not steal it, Miss Betty. And how was I to know the little chart meant so much to you? How was I to know you were starting on this trip to the Sulu Sea? Of course, you couldn't even guess that Uncle Jim would be interested, could you, Blackbeard? You couldn't even guess that he might want to carry on Professor Loring's work. And you couldn't possibly know, could you, Blackbeard, how important this uranium-235 is to our country? Why, bust my ballasters. Uh, how was I to know such a thing? Go on, Blackbeard. Well, as I was a saying, Captain Fairfield, this unscrupulous heathen crowd, blast them bilges, they was to give me a ticket back to Manila and uh, maybe pay me a little, just a little for my trouble. But they didn't. You wouldn't believe it, Captain Fairfield, but they didn't. You seem to have gotten from Hudson to San Francisco pretty quick. Why, sure I did, Jack. They paid my way there and, and, and on an airliner, too. But when I got to Frisco, they said, Blackbeard, before you return to Manila, we've got another small job for you. That job was to sink our ship, I suppose. Well, uh, not exactly that, Jack. Uh, so I says, no. Me do a thing like that to my old friends now that I know they need that chart? No, not Blackbeard. And when you wouldn't try and rob us again, I suppose they fired you. Why, riddle my rudder, you took the words right out of my mouth, Captain Fairfield. That patrol boat's bearing in, Blackbeard. You'll just about have time to tell us why you stowed away. Why, Jack, my lad, why else should I stow away except to get back to Manila again? Uncle Jim, shall I run the signal flag aloft for the patrol boat? Wait a minute, Jack. Now that Blackbeard's through, I have a few questions to ask you. Well, ask me anything, Captain Fairfield, anything you want. And jump my jib if I don't answer him frank and honest. Who's the head of this gang in Manila? Well, now, uh, that's a wee bit hard to say. Uh, he, he didn't exactly... Out with it, Blackbird, quick. Well, since you insist, Dr. Shapato. Dr. Shapato? Well, leastwise, that's what they call him. What nationality is he? Well, he's got a bit of everything in him. Who was the chap who broke into the ship? Uh, they call him Lazaro. Well, what on earth did he want, Blackbeard? Well, blow him a bow spread, Billy. I don't know. Now answer this one quickly, Blackbeard. What do you know about the ring? Uh, uh, what's that? The ring. The ring that Dr. Shapato is so keen on getting. What's the secret of it? Captain Fairfield, you've got me there. Honest, you've got me there. I wonder. All right, Blackbeard. Make yourself useful and wrap that fossil. Aye, aye, Captain Fairfield, and thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll have her up for you in a jiffy. Uncle Jim, you aren't taking him along. Yes, I am, Jack. But you don't believe him. After all, he hasn't told us a thing we didn't know before, except about Dr. Shapato. I know, Jack, but I've a hunch there's a lot more he will tell us if he's not careful. We let him think that we believe him, and we watch him like hawks. Gosh, but we'd better, Uncle Jim. He's after that chart and ring. Of course he is. We'll dump him off at Honolulu. But in the meantime, we've got to discover the secret of the ring. And maybe Blackbeard will throw us on the right track. Say, imagine crossing the Pacific with Blackbeard on board. But maybe Uncle Jim knows what he's doing. He's got to find out the secret of that ring. Anyway, you can bet there's going to be lots of excitement on board before the Spindrift gets to Honolulu. So listen in, all of you, at the same time tomorrow to the mystery of the remarkable ring with Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Want to get in on a mighty swell idea? Okay, here it is. Tomorrow afternoon, when you get home from school, hike out into the kitchen and lay hands on that big orange and blue package of Wheaties. Pour a man-sized helping into a bowl and then get set to enjoy one of the finest flavored afternoon lunches I've ever heard about. It's my bet you'll make a beeline for that pantry shelf every afternoon once you've discovered just how good those whole wheat flakes taste when school's out. And say, if the supply of Wheaties is a little low, better remind Mother to get a package or two from the grocers right away. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the bran. Won't you try Wheaties? This is Franklin McCormick saying goodbye until tomorrow for General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, who have just presented another episode of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Breakfast food in the land. 
Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Ever shall our team be champions. Come through. And that's this week's Mutual Presents feature. The Mutual Audio Network brings the best of old-time radio and modern audio theater to the world. Be sure to subscribe through the Mutual Audio Network podcast feed, any of our podcast days, or the Mutual YouTube channel, which includes MadCon and many other extra features and shows. See you all next time at Mutual Presents. Good night. Now, you seem to me to be a connoisseur of the best of radio drama. In which case, make sure you're subscribed to the Monday Matinee Feed. There we have our weekly series of dramatic, theatrical, classic, eclectic, and live radio drama. So, yeah, either the main Mutual Audio Network feed for all types and genres of audio drama, or the Monday Matinee. And we'll see you there. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.